Thanks for joining us for Together. I'm Karen Lee. April 20th is a terribly tough day for Colorado. It's been 20 years since the shootings at Columbine High School. 12 students and one teacher lost their lives that day. We will always remember the victims as we try to focus on the hurts that, in some cases, have been able to heal. For the next 30 minutes, we want to highlight the legacies they have left with all of us. Rachel Scott was a junior when she was killed at Columbine. Since her death, her family has been motivated to do something to not only honor her, but help others. Both her father and brother have created nonprofits meant to inspire young people. Rachel really did care about other people. She understood the power that a simple act of kindness can have. Rachel Scott's 17 year old life came to an end at Columbine. But in many ways, she lives on through a program called Rachel's Challenge. Her legacy described in a video narrated by her sister Dana. But after we lost Rachel, it was like we discovered this whole side of her that we had never seen before. Part of that discovery came on the back of a piece of furniture where her handprint was discovered. When she was 13 years old, she drew an outline of her hands on the back of her dresser and she wrote inside of her hands, these hands belong to Rachel Joy Scott and will someday touch millions of people's hearts. And he says that is happening. After her death, Today her family started Rachel's challenge to carry out her desire that if one goes out of their way to show compassion, it'll start a chain reaction. It'll reduce bullying, harassment, and violence. Let's make today the chain reaction moment. After Rachel's death, her family read her diary, and they pass along her message everywhere they can. She wrote in her diary, and she said, I had my ups and downs, and I failed a few times, but I did not give up. Rachel's brother, Craig, was also at Columbine the day of the shooting. He survived. How many of us know what we really want? He's now started another program called an Value Up. I have a, a message of valuing yourself and valuing others and choosing things that match that value. It definitely came out from Columbine. And through her writings, she's inspired all of us to make each and every day count. She certainly has. Frank DeAngelis was the principal of Columbine back in 1999. Since that day, he has, he has focused on rebuilding. First, he worked to rebuild Columbine. Now, he helps other principals who have been in similar situations. Rick Salinger reports. After the bullets had stopped flying, after all the funerals were held, it would have been understandable for Columbine principal Frank DeAngelis to walk away. But a pastor whispered something in his ear. I said, Frank, you should have died that day. And you didn't. Now God's got a plan. You need to go rebuild that community. A community he joined in 1979 as a coach and a teacher. He became Columbine principal in 1996. On the wall of his office were many honors and mementos. But what stood out were the names of those who were killed 20 years ago. Every morning I wake up, I recite the names of the 13, and they give me a reason for uh, getting up and doing what I'm doing. He doesn't want their deaths to be in vain. So now he heads up a group of principals from cities where school shootings have taken place. He told them, I know where you are right now. Many of you are in the first, second, third year. I represent 20 years and there is hope. Columbine has indeed rebounded over the years. Scott Christie is now the principal and says he doesn't mind that his school's name keeps coming up whenever another terrible incident occurs. I hope that they look to Columbine to see what can happen, how they can rebuild, what it can become. Frank DeAngelis retired from Columbine in 2006, but it will always be a part of him. I'm going to continue to speak on behalf of all the people, the 13 who lost their lives, the 24, and all the people who are so deeply impacted, and that's my mission in life. Frank DeAngelis joins us now. We appreciate you spending some time oh, with us. Thank you for having me. Why was it so important for you to stay at Columbine after this happened? It was important. Um, it was two days after, and I was really struggling. And I'm a person of faith, and I was questioning my faith for the first time. And Father Ken Leone calls me down to the parish where I'd been a member, and he said, Frank, you should have died that day. But God's got a plan. Now you need to go rebuild that community. And I was feeling the weight of the world. And he said, you're not going to have to walk that journey alone. And so through, from that time, I made a promise to the kids that were there, uh, the class of 2002. They were going to be seniors in 2002. And I said, 
please come back and we'll get through this together. And so I made that promise. But I still had 10 years after that before I could retire. And so I was struggling, thinking I didn't fulfill that promise. So I decided to stay until every kid was in pre every kid that was in kindergarten graduated. Right. All of a sudden, I'm getting ready to retire in 2012. A parent comes up and says, Frank, I need to talk to you. And I said, what's going on? He said, you can't retire. And I said, why? <laughs> he said, my kid's in the first year of a two-year preschool <laughs> program. And so I stayed two more years. And so I retired in 2014. So when I left, every kid who was in that Columbine community had graduated, and I had been their principal. Mm -hmm. So I That's felt beautiful. I fulfilled that promise. And what are you doing now? I know that you're you're traveling around and you're you're trying to help others that right. have been in your same situation. Right. You know, I made a comment almost 20 years ago that I just joined a club in which no one wants to be a member. Yeah. And now I, I remember people reaching out to me. One name that stands out was Bill Bond. He was a principal at Paducah in uh, high, or at Heath High School mm -hmm. in Paducah. And it was he reached out to me, and I remembered that. And now just paying it forward. And it was interesting. Probably a month ago, I received a phone call from the National Association of Secondary School Principals, and they said, Frank, we're thinking of starting this network. I'm, I oh, mean, we great. do things yeah. informally, mm -hmm. but would you be willing to head it up? And so I was in Washington, D.C. two weeks ago, and there were 16 principals there that had had similar situations, Parkland, Santa Fe, and other places. Too many. Too many. Mm -hmm. But we're together. And it was interesting when they said, Frank, we want you to be our spokesperson because after these tragedies happen, we received so many phone calls. We're just inundated with this information. But when we saw Columbine principal Frank D'Angelis, we picked up that call. Mm -hmm. And even though we can help you in mm -hmm. certain parts of the country, that initial phone call from get, getting to you will make that connection that we need. Frank, quickly, how can people get involved and how can they help out your efforts here? Oh, my efforts. One of the things that I represent that's near and dear to my heart is the Columbine Memorial. Mm -hmm. And that was dedicated in 2006. And we're, we want to make sure that that legacy lives on long past myself and others. It's a generational thing. And the parents of the deceased and the injured students put so much love yeah. into that. And so, boy, just looking donations to keep that going would be wonderful. Yeah. Frank, thank you so much for Thanks, spending Karen. some time My with us. Pleasure. We appreciate it. Thank you. Well, there is a peaceful place where all are welcome to come and remember those who lost their lives that day. We're going to look at how it's providing hope and healing to the family members of the victims. Together with Karen Lee, sponsored by Canvas Credit Union. We're Canvas, and we've got you covered, Colorado. Go live. permanent memorial to the victims sits in Clement Park. It's a place for survivors and the community to gather together. It's a place to heal the heart, as Mackenzie O'Keefe discovered. Tucked away in Clement Park, you'll find a place of serenity, a quiet breeze, water flowing, the place where 13 lives are honored and remembered every day. The names will be never forgotten. Over the years, the memorial has been a place to grieve and a place to heal. Rick Townsend is president of the Columbine Memorial Foundation. His daughter, Lauren, was killed in the 1999 shooting. I walk over to Lauren's plaque and, and, uh, and I read it and see what she had to say because it's in, written in her words. There you'll find the names of each victim, words written by loved ones engraved in stone. I feel from sad, uh, contemplative, um, I feel fulfilled sometimes that that there is this place to come to. And that's the purpose, a place for neighbors, friends, and complete strangers to come and heal. You're able to just think and reflect about 
the world. You'll find a tree where faded blue ribbons hang, a flower placed gently near each name, and the wall of healing, covered in quotes written by students who survived. Their words are powerful. They still are today. I think of how these students and families were impacted. It's just, and what they've gone through. A place that reminds people that even 20 years later, there's hope in looking forward. Praise, I suppose, of, of the lives that uh, we lost and, and gratitude for the years that we did have with them. Knowing that together, the community is Columbine strong. I think it shows that when evil happens, evil could be so, so loud and overpowering, but goodness comes along and uh, it fills in that void and it's calming and hopeful and loving, and I think it it lasts forever. Boy, does it. Columbine survivors are strong in spirit. They have a lot to share with others. How they're coming together to help victims of other mass shootings and people all over the world under what they've created called the Rebels Project. After the Aurora Theater shooting, a group of Columbine survivors created the Rebels Project. Now, the idea was to help support people who have experienced a similar trauma. Sherry Lawson is a director of development for the Rebels Project. We appreciate you being here with us today and talking a little bit about this. Sherry. Thank you so much for having me. So Sherry was not a Columbine, but she, uh, she too survived a shooting. So explain to us a little bit about what you went through. So I was living in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and I was um, a contractor, um, and I was based at uh, Washington Navy Yard. So I was working with the program there um, for about two years. And um, one Monday morning in September of 2013, um, another contractor who had been there for about a month came in to the building and um, began shooting my coworkers. Um, I mm -hmm. ran out with a group of people. Um, we were in an alleyway and ended up having to scale the eight-foot brick wall um, that surrounds the, the Navy Yard, scale that and then continue to run up um, the street to get away from the shooter because he was in pursuit of the group of people that I was, I was with. I'm sorry for that. Thank you. Sherry, how has the Rebels Project helped you and others heal? How, what's its purpose here? So the mission for the Rebels Project is to provide support for survivors mm -hmm. of mass tragedies. Um, and I found them about three months after the shooting, um, the Navy Yard shooting. I joined them um, because I was desperate for a supportive community. Um, I felt like the people around me didn't understand what I was going through. And it was kind of like, it's been a few months. Why aren't you OK yet? And so I reached out. Um, I told them I didn't, wasn't sure if I was a survivor. And they invited me um, to join. And I flew out to Denver for the first time about six months later. Um, to go to a meetup with some Aurora movie theater mm -hmm. um, survivors and um, some teens from Sandy Hook that were out visiting the state that, that year. How, why, and um, how has it changed your life? And why is it so important that the survivors can get together and, and share? So one of the things that um, Heather Martin, one of our co-founders, has mm -hmm. said a lot recently is that um, connectedness is resilience. Mm -hmm. And just having that connection um, among survivors. I, I remember um, coming to Colorado for the first time and walking into the restaurant where the meetup was and for the first time feeling comfortable to be wherever I was, mm -hmm. um, whether that was crying or laughing. Um, I, I knew no one was judging me for whatever emotions I was, I was feeling. And a lot of survivors need that. We need that validation. Um, we have a closed Facebook group of about a thousand members representing 60 different mass tragedies and um, much of the discussion is validating your emotions um, and also just sharing resources and how we are able to get through. That's amazing. That is really, really great to hear. So if people want to help out the Rebels Project, how can they and what do they do? Well, we, we are a volunteer, fully volunteer-led um, program right now. We are a nonprofit, 5013C. Um, so right now we need money. We need a lot of funds. Um, we're growing astronomically right now, um, and we're just struggling to keep up with everything. Um, so the more money people can donate would be amazing um, for us to connect survivors from all over this country and even the world now. We're, we're getting calls from Brazil that recently had a shooting, um, as well as New Zealand. Um, so they can go to our website, therebelsproject.org, and there's a donate um, button on there. Um, and yeah, donate funds. That's what we need right now. Sherry, sure, thank you so much for spending time with us and, and talking about uh, your experience with all of this. Absolutely. Thank you so much for yeah. having me. We appreciate you. Well, hope. That's what Columbine wants to be known for. We're going to share with you how the school library has become a living symbol of that four-letter word. Columbine does not want to be remembered for one day of its history. 
The Columbine community is about so much more, which is why so many people came together, including the parents of victims, to create a place of hope right on campus. This is so much more than a library. This is filled with hope. Its view of the mountains through the windows provides a vision to help leave the hurt behind. Don Anna's daughter, Lauren Townsend, was one of those killed at Columbine. Lauren's friends, students came to us and said they want us back in that library where so much had happened. So many children had been murdered, injured. The old library was removed, replaced by an atrium. The families wanted to help build a new one, so Dawn, Anna, and her husband Bruce Beck joined with others. It had only been about five or six weeks since we lost our loved ones, and to come and look at this place now and see that all that's been done with the help of community, the help of the whole nation, it's pretty amazing. The project involved designing and construction. It also represented the beginning steps on the road from tragedy to recovery. To have that kind of bonding between the families, I think gave us a real springboard to recovery and having to fundraise together really joined us together. The Hope Columbine High School Library has become a symbol. The name says it all, Hope. This was a place of rebuilding, place of unity. What you see is a work of love by those who have had holes in their hearts. My goal has been since April 20th, 1999, to do something every day to make my heart bigger so that the hole doesn't seem so large. Before we go, I want to take a moment to discuss how difficult it can be to talk about school threats and security, but it's an important conversation to have with our kids, especially this week after 19 districts across Colorado closed on Wednesday because of a threat. The National Association of School Psychologists encourages us to talk with our kids, listen to them, and reassure them that there are a lot of people working together to keep them safe and acknowledge whatever it is that they're feeling. Share that we also have a lot of support and security around us. Validate how they're feeling that this is a scary time. It's okay to feel scared. And also balance that with reassurance that schools by and large are very safe places to be. And stay in touch with your kids. Make sure that you pay attention to any changes in their behavior. On Thursday, kids across Colorado returned to class, and they were welcomed in a big way by many. Take this school, for example, in Douglas County. Students were waved in with hugs and sweet messages. This was what Sage Canyon Elementary School in Castle Rock looked like. Kids were welcomed to school with this colorful art. Students, staff, and officers came together to create it. The sidewalks were filled with positive messages of hope and love. It was all meant to make sure that the kids knew just how many people were working hard to keep them safe. Well, thank you for joining us on this week's episode of Together. We'll be back next week with even more messages of love and hope. But for now, we want to end this show with some sights and sounds that will hopefully soothe your soul a little. Photojournalist Dale Atchison shows us the peaceful scenes of Rocky Mountain National Park.